Hello, bearded bee people. Welcome back to Bean KBs for what I believe is part five of section one of our beekeeping crash course. So this is the last bit on honeybee biology. Um, and we are talking about nutritional requirements. This is probably going to be a shorter video compared to the ones uh, earlier in this section. But let's get into it. Hello, kitty. So uh, honeybee nutritional requirements, um, much like humans and kitties, uh, they have, they have uh, a few different things that they absolutely need. So carbohydrates is one. Nectar is the main source of carbs for honeybees. Forager bees bring in nectar and add the enzymes invertase and gluco glucose oxidase to it on the way back from their, the flowers on the way back to the hive. Uh, once back at the hive, the nectar is passed from worker to worker, adding more enzymes that continue to break down the more complex sucrose molecule, molecules into simpler glucose and fructose, and it also acidifies the honey. So after they add all of these enzymes to it, the house bees put it into cells, and then other house bees dehydrate it. So what started off as maybe 80% water ends up something around 12 to 17 percent water. And what also started out with sucrose, like the table sugar that we know of, ends up with much simpler sugar molecules, glucose and fructose. So this high sugar content, uh, the acidity and all that, it is one of, that is the, the set of circumstances that allows for honey to have an almost infinite shelf life. <clears throat> so, along with carbohydrates, bees need protein. Um, honeybees require 10 different amino acids, which are essentially the building blocks of, of proteins. <clears throat> they cannot synthesize these amino acids, and therefore, so they can't make them inside themselves, so therefore they're dependent upon finding pollen. Pollen not only offers these amino acids, but other vitamins and essential nutrients and minerals. So the, the protein is brought back, the pollen is brought back on the hind legs of forager bees. The hind legs uh, have long hairs on them that we call pollen baskets because when they're on the way back to the hive, it really does look like they've got a bunch of stuff stuffed in a grocery basket on their hind legs. When they get back to the hive, they take this stuff off and hand it essentially to house bees. House bees bring it into the hive and add nectar and smash it into cells, usually on top of some uh, bee bread from before, and this starts the process of fermenting it into what we know of as uh, uh, bee bread. And so bee bread is consumed only by the young bees. The uh, older bees don't have the ability to break it down and to utilize it, so uh, when older bees need protein, they've got to beg the younger house bees for it. So the young bees, after having, you know, eaten this bee bread, uh, develop glands that allow for them to produce brood food for the young bees. Um, pollen is an interesting thing in the sense that not all pollen is equal in terms of nutritional requirement or nutritional content or pr protein amount or anything like that. So a natural, diverse uh, source of pollens is necessary for a healthy bee population. You can't really sustain a colony on pollen supplement alone. And if you know that you are in an area that uh, doesn't have a whole lot of naturally available pollen, uh, supplementing is probably a good idea for you because, uh, I mean, here in Michigan, we don't really have that problem. I usually end up having to pull uh, bee bread frames out of colonies in midsummer, but and I know in other areas that can be an issue. And so, if you don't see a lot of bee bread in your hives, and you notice that your young bees aren't being fed very, uh, very well, like they look dry on the bottom of the cells, um, giving them some nectar and some pollen is probably a good idea. So, being aware of what type of availability your bees have to natural sources of food is a very good thing. Okay, and then lastly, we have royal jelly. Royal jelly is a nutrient-rich secretion produced by nurse bees for young worker larvae and queen larvae. 
Uh, royal jelly contains high amounts of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and is generally more nutrient dense than the brood food that workers that worker larvae are switched to after the first few days of larval development. So this stuff is really, really nutrient rich, and it's one of the reasons why queen larvae grow so fast. Um, and it's the the nutrients in it are. Uh, So the, this is yet another uh, area where paying attention to your bees' nutrition is important because, I mean, if they don't have the, the right ingredients to create nutrient-rich royal jelly, your bees and your queens that are being created are going to come out substandard. Uh, for this reason, that's why I have uh, ample amounts of both carbohydrates and protein on all of my cell builders all of the time, regardless of how much food they have inside the hive, I always have a, a feeder and a pollen patty on them because there can never be too much when you're trying to raise queens because this royal jelly takes a lot of energy to create and it contains a lot of energy. So uh, there can't be too much in terms of nutrient rich food when your bees are creating queen cells. All right, so to supplement as a beekeeper, um, to supplement your bees' carbohydrate intake, it's best to stick with white granulated sugar. The sugar in the raw may seem like it's a good idea, but once again, that's an area where it's counterintuitive. You may think that it's healthier or more natural, but in reality, the stuff that makes the sugar in the raw brown are plant solids that are difficult for our bees to digest. So regardless of the source of your sugar, make sure that it's white granulated sugar. Um, and then whether it's beet or cane sugar is up to you, um, because at that point, after the refinement process, it is pretty much pure sucrose. So avoid anything brown and get just that white granulated sugar when you're uh, trying to supplement your bees' carbohydrate intake. So in the spring, uh, the syrup should mimic nectar to instigate buildup and to mimic the uh, nectar flow that is to come in the spring. Uh, and by, or in order to mimic nectar, we make the syrup super thin. So one to one sugar to water, or even one to two sugar to water, or one to 1.5. Just make sure it's pretty much the consistency of water. So in the fall, we're gonna switch that around two to one sugar to water so that it mimics or mimics honey and will instigate them to store it rather than to build up on it. Uh, so that will help them get prepared for winter. In the winter, however, if you are in a northern climate like I am, dry sugar is the best. Feeding anything that is liquidous uh, can be problematic. You know, too much moisture in the hive and, and Temperature is too low for them to really be drinking liquid stuff anyway. So you can make a sugar brick or you can just pour white granulated sugar right out of the bag onto the tops of the frames um, in what's called the mountain camp method. Protein. So there are many different protein supplements available from commercial beekeeping supply stores. These can vary in nutritional content and should never be considered as good as natural pollen. My advice for feeding it is to use it in the spring if you feel the need, um, but don't really mess around with it unless you see a, a, a hive that absolutely has none. Because uh, as I had said in previous parts of this crash course, there is an epigenetic change that happens in late summer when the availability of fresh pollen dwindles, the winter bees are going to start being reared. So. Now, once again, normally at that point, I've got ample pollen in my hives and I would never think of feeding it then. Um, if you don't have ample pollen, then sure, put it on there. If you do, then only really consider feeding pollen in the spring um, and that'll help your bees to have enough resources to start building up maybe a little bit quicker. Um, so yeah, and in feeding that pollen, if you have the ability to feed the dry stuff I like that a little bit better um, because of the fact that it doesn't attract any pests. The patties I use for my cell builders because I want to give it specifically 
to that hive, but I have to be very mindful of that because if the bees ignore it at all, it can be a place where small hive beetle larvae can take foot and, and really just start to grow numbers. So the only real time I've ever seen a small hive beetle issue in hives of mine in Michigan uh, was when they ignored a uh, pollen patty. So they have their, their advantages and disadvantages, just be aware of each. Um, and once again, don't ever consider the supplements as good as natural stuff. Um, yeah, so I think that is it. Yep, here's my bibliography for the uh, five parts, for my portion of the five parts. Um, as I've said before, all this content will be available on bkbs.com and fremontareabeekeepers.org. Um, the next section of it that I'm going to be presenting at our local bee club in February is going to be on being a good beekeeper, month-to-month uh, -month hive maintenance, how to split a hive, how to prevent swarming, how to pull honey when to add boxes, all that type of stuff. So it's going to be full of awesome information for young beekeepers and experienced beekeepers. So for new beekeepers and experienced beekeepers, don't um, start putting those videos out until after I've presented it at the local bee club, and I present that uh, in about two weeks, in, in 10 days or two weeks to the local bee club. So watch out for those videos very, very soon. Um, I hope you guys are digging it. Like I've said in the previous videos, this is pretty much the only bee content I can come out with right now. And so I hope it's useful. I hope it's satiating your curiosity and satiating your need for bee stuff in the middle of the winter. So thanks for watching. Get out there and have some fun with your bees if you can. Otherwise, have a good rest of your day. See ya.